Let's go to the Lord in prayer for a time in Bible study. Father, we are thankful this morning uh, to be able to unite with you in the blessings of being courageous for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we know that left to us during these days is quite a challenge. Uh, Father, we see all around us uh, conflict and upheaval and turmoil. And especially as we continue into this election season, as we see two hurricanes potentially in the Gulf at one time, as we see wildfires in California of a magnitude never seen before, as we see a, an online, on land hurricane in Iowa never seen before, Lord, we wonder in our hearts what's it going to take for this nation to repent? Uh, what's it going to take for the nation as a whole uh, to be on their knees, on our knees before you? And Lord, we can't speak for the nation and we can't emblemize the nation, but we can stand for and speak for this church. And so we are on our knees this morning, Lord, repenting before you for the great sins that are in our midst, uh, not only within the confines of this church, but our national sin of abortion where we have put to death over 60 million unborn children. Lord, a holocaust unlike anything that's ever been accomplished in, in the history of the world. Uh, let alone all the, the abortions that are taking place around the world, Lord. We can't help but think that this is a season of, of judgment unlike any that we've experienced before. Uh, Lord, we are mindful of the wake-up call that you brought to us on 9-11 when the whole nation did come to its knees. But Lord, we saw how fast that fizzled away. Uh, Lord, may we be sobered by what's going on in our midst May we be brought to the end of ourselves uh, for the sake of our nation and our families and our friends, Lord. Uh, we know that repentance needs to begin in the church, and it's certainly where revival begins. And we pray for that sort of revival to spring forth out of the church, out of the churches. And we pray especially for those churches that are threatened um, with legal action simply for gathering together. Uh, Lord, again, we appeal to you for your divine protection, for you to be glorified, and for our hearts to be filled again, Lord, as we turn to the study of your word in this wonderful book that you've given us today uh, to look into. Uh, Father, we pray that every heart would be challenged, that every heart would be ruled, under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, and that we would have a great sense of understanding and peace according to your word this morning. And we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Well, the book of Philippians is Paul's love letter to a church. And we note, as we had mentioned when we studied the book of Ephesians, that this book, Philippians, is prison epistle, if you will. Um, there are four prison epistles, Ephesians, Philippians that we're looking at this morning, Colossians, and Philemon, as it's generally pronounced, but if you know anything about Greek, it's actually Philemon, and uh, that's easily provable, but uh, not to throw anybody off, we'll call it Philemon just to, uh, to not cause any sort of upset. And Paul is writing this book historically, possibly as a response to the latest gift um, given to him. Uh, chapter 4, verse 10 makes reference to a gift that this church at Philippi has sent to Paul. And the pattern, the pattern of this church had been to support Paul, and we have great evidence through their support of their love for him. And that's the way that it always is when a church is a sending church, when a church is aligned with the heart of God. And we understand that whatever difficulties Paul faced, and they were many, he always knew he could count on the church he founded at Philippi to support him. And not just financially, but also emotionally and spiritually. 
And so the tone of this letter is completely different from any of his other epistles. Almost entirely devotional in nature, we remember that uh, the other epistles that Paul wrote to the churches uh, were primarily divided into two sections, um, doctrine followed by um, application. And, and that's not the case in this particular letter. And his words set this apart right from the very beginning of this epistle. We read in verses 1 and 2, Paul and Timothy, Timothy who was with Paul in Rome as he's presently in prison, um, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ. We talked about bondservants last week, and hopefully you remember what we had to say about that. To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, uh, speaking to the, the leadership of the church, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And you'll note there is something that's missing if you're familiar with the way that Paul generally speaking begins his epistles. And one of the things that you may note is that he makes no claim. He doesn't proclaim the fact that he is an apostle uh, of Jesus Christ. And I think the reason for that is because in the case of this church, there's no need for that. Uh, they already believed in him, and they needed no further convincing uh, in any shape or form. They, they fully understood not only his calling, but theirs. Uh, we continue reading, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you with all joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ Jesus, the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ, the glory to the glory and praise of God. They fully understood not only Paul's calling, but theirs. And this is really important in the life of any church. And just thinking about things regarding the history of any church, to know within the, the hearts and minds of those who comprise that particular local body of Christ, as in the case of the church at Philippi, to know that, that the church planter has been divinely called and directed by God. Um, helpful to know a little bit of the history around this church uh, to understand uh, the nature, the devotional nature of the epistle that Paul writes to the church. And, and we see this in Acts chapter 16, if you would turn there with me. And in Acts chapter 16, beginning at verse 6, we remember the story pertaining to Paul's missionary journey and his first journey and his visit to the church, visit to the city of, of Philippi, church not even founded yet, but a calling to the city of divine nature, a calling to the city of divine origin. And we read in Acts chapter 16, beginning at verse 6, Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. That's kind of unique, isn't it? Why would the Holy Spirit ever forbid anyone, including, especially including the Apostle Paul, from preaching the word in a particular region of this world because everywhere in the world, and this is something that we need to understand, um, there is a need for the gospel of Jesus Christ everywhere. Why would the Holy Spirit prevent Paul from preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in the region that he had a mind to go to? And, and we don't understand, we don't have any way of knowing how it was exactly that the Holy Spirit prevented Paul 
Paul from going there. We only know that he did. And so after they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, which is in the, sort of the northern region of what we would consider to be modern-day Turkey. But the Spirit did not permit them. Again, that's fascinating. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, Macedonia is Europe, and in the way that they thought of the continents in their day, Asia would have been anything east of Macedonia, Asia, modern-day Turkey, um, not the Orient as we think of it today, but Asia, anything east of what we consider to be modern-day Europe, which Paul is referring to here as actually Luke writing the book of Acts about Paul. Um, it's a reference to what we consider to be the continent of Europe. And, and so with this move into the Western territories, um, we find ourselves the recipients of the extension of Paul's ministry through that territory into the continent of Europe. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. Uh, a man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia. That note that we there, that lets us know that Luke is part of Paul's traveling party at this time, Dr. Luke. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. And so there's that divine call, not only divinely pre prevented from continuing his ministry where he thought he wanted to go, but divinely called to a new location that apparently Paul did not have on his mind, but God did. And therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day to Neapolis. And from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. It was a Roman colony city, which means that it was primarily inhabited by those from Rome. There were a lot of uh, generals and officers from the Roman army there and a lot of citizens of Rome, very few Jews, as we'll see in just a moment. There weren't even enough Jews to establish a synagogue there. It required at least 10 Jews to uh, have a synagogue in a city or a village, and there was not one found there. So when they came to Philippi, which was a colony of Rome, uh, we were staying in that city for some days, and on the Sabbath, Saturday, we went out of the city since there was no synagogue there for Paul to preach in, his usual pattern going to the synagogue first. So he went looking for the Jews where they might be found. And he went to the riverside where prayer was customarily made in the city of Philippi. That's where the Jews met. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira. So she wasn't a European either. She was from the Asian side of the equation. She was from the city of Thyatira, and she worshiped God. And the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. So she surrendered to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and when she and her household were baptized, water baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. Fascinating to think about how it is that God not only redirects us, but directs us, and then brings us to the exact people. Now, we note that a couple things, of, a couple points of interest along the way. It was a man who stood up and said, come to Macedonia, and the first person who's saved here, evidently, uh, as it's recorded for us, is this woman, Lydia, who's a seller of purple, which would have been equivalent to someone who sells diamonds in our day, because purple cloth was extremely rare and extremely expensive due to the nature of how it was made. And we talked about that on previous occasions, especially when we were teaching through the book of Acts in chapter 16, so you can refer to that. But that worm that produced the, the ooze from which that purple dye was made 
Um, it took thousands of them to make a garment. And that's why purple was the color of royalty. And so this woman, Lydia, would have been someone who was very prominent um, in the business workings of the city of Philippi. Now, in thinking of the special nature of Paul's calling and how we referred to this earlier, uh, I think it's important for the church, I think it's important for any church to have some sense that the church planter has been not only divinely called, but divinely directed by God. And, and I'm wondering if I couldn't just for a moment um, share with you what took place in my life in the planting of this church. And it's, I've shared this on a few occasions along the way, but I think it's important to, to bring this back around um, every so often so that you would have the same sense that I think the church at Philippi has about the special nature of who it is that's been called to the church. Not that the man is special, but the special nature of the calling in the direction of God. Um, some of you may be aware that along about 2000, 2001, uh, I was sensing a calling on my heart uh, to be a pastor. And I had actually been on the beach. I was attending a worship conference, interestingly enough, at Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale, and I was sitting on the beach at Fort Lauderdale. And uh, I just reached that place in my heart where I said, you know, I was sensing this calling, and I just said, Lord, I'll do whatever it is that you want me to do. Whatever that is, I'll do it. And so being unburdened from any sort of hesitancy about what God might call me to do, I just continued on about my life. Now, this idea of being a pastor was also confirmed in me by my pastor. I was attending Calvary Chapel, Austin, and he actually invited me to be on staff. And I said, well, I will. I'll take that step if you'll train me, if you'll um, put me through some sort of equipping process that would give me a sense of confidence about being a pastor. And so he invited me. He actually invented, um, due to my request, uh, sort of a one-year training program, reading through a number of books and so on and so forth, where he could sit not only with me, but with a few other guys that he had on staff that he could train through that process. And it was through that process that I began to sense that not only was I called to be a assistant pastor, which I had been invited to be uh, it, at Calvary Chapel Austin, but I sensed something along the way through this training program that, that God was actually calling me to be a senior pastor and, and to go and plant a church. And that's sort of the model of, of Calvary Chapel Ministries. But there's a, a huge problem with that, if you think about it, of, of stepping out of your life completely where you are and in a sense, stepping off a cliff, a place of no support, because for me to leave Austin would mean quitting my job, um, selling my house, moving my family somewhere where the Lord was leading us to go. And not only that, but if you know me, my, past, my personality is not necessarily that dynamic a personality. I'm not necessarily the kind of person that draws people to himself. And I saw that as a, a great hindrance. I'm more of a, an introvert. I'm a quiet person. I'm not really a people person. Um, I'm more of that now than I've ever been in my life through the through process of, of how God has worked in me. So I was very concerned and, and fearful about, you know, for any church planner, the, the thought of going to a city that doesn't have a Calvary Chapel, which we had been trained to do, uh, not to build on another man's foundation. To go to a city where you don't know anybody and, and think of the idea of how is it can you ever plant a church where there is none? Uh, not a Calvary Chapel, by the way, um, where you don't know anybody. How, how can that take place? And so I was very troubled by this in, in my soul. I was. Um, even though I sensed the calling, even though I was faithfully walking along with the Lord, in trusting that he was indeed calling me, um, Tina had confirmed that as well, so we were both praying about it. And, and then a very strange thing happened to me one morning in my time of devotions. And, and I'm going to tell you about these things, and, and you may think I'm a wacko by the time I get done telling you about these things, but they happened to me nonetheless, um, as God is my witness. As I was in prayer on March the 18th, 2001, I had a vision on the inside of my eyelids with gold letters, and I can still remember what that looked like. And what I saw was Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12. 
And at the time, I, I, you know, I just got saved in, in 93, um, came forward in 94, um, was baptized in 94, water baptized in 94. I, I had not been a student of God's Word for that long. I, I was certainly not a chapter and verse guy. So when I saw that verse kind of come up on the inside of my eyelids, the best way that I could express it, I had to go look and see what that verse said. So why don't we likewise go look and see what that verse says. It's, it's Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12. And this idea that I had that I was, I was very anxious about the idea of planting a church, God said this to me. And of course, he's speaking about Jesus Christ. But remember last week, we talked about the nature of being directed by God and how you can be reading a passage that has an entirely different meaning, but there will be a scripture that jumps off the page that the Lord will use to divinely direct you in his will for your life. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12, I read this, looking it up, and I was kind of anxious, and in fact, I was a little bit like scared almost to see what it said. It said this, but this man, again, this is speaking about Jesus Christ, and that's important. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. And the Lord spoke to me through that verse, and this is what he said. The work is already finished. You don't have to worry about it. That I will accomplish the work. All I need you to do is be faithful to go. And so that was a great sense of stress relief in my life, if you will. Now, a few days later, on March the 26th, after that, nothing more happened, strange or supernatural. After that, on March the 26th of 2001, the Lord showed me the same way, gold letters on the inside of my eyelids, the best way that I could describe it. Um, Ezekiel chapter 40, verse 2, and it was this. If you are there with me, in the visions of God, Ezekiel writes, he took me into the land of Israel. And of course, this is about uh, the millennial temple and the millennial kingdom it has nothing to do with my life. And yet the Lord spoke to me through this verse. In the visions of God, he took me into the land of Israel and set me on a very high mountain. On it toward the south was something like the structure of a city. So that spoke to my heart about, I'm in Austin, Texas, so somewhere south of Austin, Texas is where I believe the Lord is communicating to me that he is going to send me and my family to plant a church. A little bit later, on April the 17th of 2001, the Lord, again, I'm in prayer, not thinking anything of it, um, you know, just regular morning prayers, all of a sudden another verse appears, best I can describe it, on the inside of my eyelids. And this time it was Joshua chapter 3, verse 3. And um, in Joshua chapter 3, verse 3, if I can get there, we read this. And this is about the people crossing the Jordan River, sort of famous passage. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priests and the Levites bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. I was like, whoa, you know, because, okay, the Lord's done the work. You're going to go somewhere toward the south from Austin, and when you see the Ark of the Covenant move, head out after it. What did that mean? Well, that sort of spoke to me, and, and again, you know, the Lord's not directly communicating exactly what these things mean, trying to, to put it together prayerfully, but there seems to be some sense of when you see the Ark of the Covenant move, head out after it. Well, the Ark of the Covenant doesn't exist anymore, so how am I going to head out after the Ark of the Covenant? What does that mean, Lord? And I continue to ask, does that mean like when I see the moving van move, do I follow after the, the moving van? I mean, that 
that was sort of the, the conclusion that I came to about that. And then finally, on May the 1st, 2001, same kind of, of thing again, um, speaking about the nature of the work and the leading and the power of the Holy Spirit involved in the work. This time it was Joshua chapter 3, verse 8. And again, I didn't know these verses. I had to go look at them to see what, what the Lord was even telling me. But uh, some of you probably already know that this very powerful verse, Joshua chapter 3, verse 8, you shall command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, when you have come to the edge of the water of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. So before the river was even parted, if you know the story of the Israelites that are about to go into Israel, they had to step into, the, they had to put their feet in the water before the water was parted. So they had to be, you know, following God's, doing what God said to do, no matter what, uh, before they even saw God work. So I had this set of verses and didn't hear any more. Didn't hear any more. Now, through just the normal course of doing things, you know, sensing the Lord's leading and sort of taking care of business, selling our house, quitting my job, that sort of thing, um, going through the summer, things progressing really fast. Our house sold really fast uh, during the month of August. Actually sold our house to a 17-year-old kid, which just seems like so, so impossible. But uh, on August 1st of that year, uh, my pastor in Austin began to teach through 1 Samuel. And on, it had already been decided that we were going to be, that our last Sunday in Austin, through just normal, you know, doing what you sense God is leading you to do, was going to be August the 26th, which was the fourth Sunday in August that year. And so on the first Sunday in August, my pastor, who generally taught a chapter a week, kind of like me, um, he began to teach in 1 Samuel. And so it had already been decided that we were going to leave, that our, our last Sunday was August the 26th, which was going to be the fourth Sunday in August. And he started teaching 1 Samuel just out of the blue, because he, he was not a guy that taught through the Bible. He would teach a book at a time. Some Calvary Chapel guys do that. Now, if you put it together in your mind, if you're familiar with the book of 1 Samuel, what happens on not the, the first Sunday, the second Sunday, the third Sunday, the fourth Sunday, when we're going to be leaving... That was already predecided. When I saw that he was starting to teach through 1 Samuel in the first Sunday of August, the hair on the back of my neck stood up because what happens in chapter 4 of the book of 1 Samuel? Anybody remember? That's the story of Israel being in a, in a war with the Philistines and losing. And what did they do? They called for the Ark of the Covenant to come out. And it still gets me to this day. That, that the Lord had said, remember, when you see the Ark and the Covenant move, head out after it. So let me just tell you, when, when you have that sort of, and we were talking about this to a degree last week about being led by what God's Word you, tells you to do, commands you to do, shows you to do. That's what happened in my life. And, and so that was our last Sunday was when the teaching about the Ark of the Covenant being moved, and we did indeed head out after it. So I say that to say this, that in my humble estimation, and again, nothing special about me, all glory to God, that there is a divine, not only a divine calling to, and there's a whole other story about how we wound up in Naples initially, um, forgetting about that for the moment, but there is a a special divine calling on your pastor. Again, nothing special about me. It's very humbling to present this to you. Um, but it's also helpful to you to know that God has been the one all along to bring about this church. And so we see that in, in the life of Paul. It's, it's very important to know, I think, 
the church planner has been divinely called and directed by God. And that's what we saw in the life of Paul with the church at Philippi. And, and that's what established such a special relationship between Paul and this church. And, and not only that, but to know that God has his hand upon this work. Not only did he start it, not only did he send the man divinely and direct the timing of when the church was planted, but also to understand and, and know that God continues to have his hand upon this work and, and again, it's Acts chapter 16, as we continue in that same story about what took place in the life of Philippi, that I think informs his relationship, not only to this church, but this church's relationship to Paul. Now it happened, it says, in Acts chapter 16, verse 16, now it happened as we went to prayer, that a certain slave girl, possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. And this girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are the servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days, I'm sure very annoying. I mean, the last thing that a, a true minister of Jesus Christ needs is somebody who's demon possessed uh, doing their advertising for them. This she did for many days, and Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. So, you know, those that would comprise this church, they're watching um, the power of the ministry of the apostle Paul. And when her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and, and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, these men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us being Romans to, to receive or observe. And then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. Now, you're one of these people that's come to know the Lord through the initial ministry of the apostle Paul at Philippi, and you see this taking place, that the enemy has come against Paul. Um, Paul has stood his ground, driven out this demon spirit from this girl. Um, the people who were selling these trinkets and, and idols, um, their business being negated by those who were coming to Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so Paul was caught up in the sort of capitalistic um, nonsense of that selling of, of idols, little statues. And, and they laid many stripes on them. Imagine looking on and seeing that taking place in the life of their, their pastor the Apostle Paul, the one who planted their church, and they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. And having received such a charge, he put them in the inner prison, in the very center of the prison, in the most secure location, and fastened them, fastened their feet in the stocks. Of course, we know the rest of the story, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm for we are all here. And then he called for a light, ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. And then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them that same hour of the night and, and washed their stripes or their wounds and immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, they set the food before them and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. And the story goes on to tell us that the, the magistrates having understood that Paul was actually a, a Roman citizen and how, how in danger they were for having beaten a Roman citizen without a trial. Um, came and sought to release Paul from prison, and he basically waited for them to apologize over what they had done. Now, you come and get me out of prison, and, and then I'll come out. 
But think about the reaction of the church at Philippi, this newly founded church at Philippi, and all that they've seen in the life of this one that God has divinely sent to establish this church. That's pretty amazing stuff, isn't it? That Paul came, and whether they knew the backstory of how it is that he arrived there, but I'm certain that he shared it with them, because it's very important for people to understand the, the nature of the calling on the man who has been led by God to lead them. And then seeing him imprisoned and thinking, oh, no. And then experiencing that earthquake there and then hearing the story about how all the, jail, all, all the doors of the jail were flung open. Nobody left. The jailer and his entire family were saved. They all became born-again believers in Jesus Christ through the process. That's a church that has some confidence that God's in the work, isn't it? And again, if time permitted, I could tell you over and over again the stories where God has magnificently not only sustained, but built this church along the way in its almost 20-year history as well. Um, if I could tell you some of the stories about uh, along the way, the, the buildings that we've been in, the, the purchase of this building, uh, the lease of this building in the first place, all steps that we took that were vastly beyond our ability to afford them, that our numbers could not possibly support, and yet having favor from financial institutions, from those who would lease the building, from lending agencies, those who normally would never give out money to an establishment like this, and yet we had God's favor. And he provided at each step along the way. It would make the hair on the back of your neck stand up just like it does mine. And I have the unique, and it's a wonderfully unique vantage point that I have, a wonderfully unique perspective of just being able to stand back and see all that God has done and know that I didn't do any of it, that God has done all of it, all of it. But I can say this, I do have a strong sense of confidence that God is in this work and he has, he has his hand upon it. That's no credit to me. That's credit, all glory to God and his involvement in this church. And to have this certainty that Paul notes here that, and I just think, I think this is an absolute necessity, to have this certainty that what God has begun, he will continue. Where does that come from? Where does that degree of certainty come from? And this produces a great sense of confidence in the church for both the leadership and the body and for over, really, of the full involvement of Christ in this ministry. And, and isn't that what you want to know about your church, that, that Christ is fully involved in this ministry? And I think this is the confidence that the church at Philippi had, not only about Paul, but about their church, about God seeing the need for this church in this city and calling those divinely who would come to this church. Doesn't that instill in you a sense, can't you identify with the, the people in the church at Philippi over the degree of confidence that they would have that not only did God start this work, but he's in the work and he's going to continue the work because he has his hand upon the work. It, it was the same sort of, of confidence that Jesus spoke about in John's Gospel, chapter 6. I've always loved this passage because it is one of these confidence-producing passages, and it is indeed intended by Jesus to do exactly that. In John's Gospel, chapter 6, Jesus said, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Let's see if I can turn pages one-handed. When you have a, a teacher who desires to teach the whole counsel of, of the Word of God, teaching a congregation 
hungry to know the whole counsel of God's word, and you throw in some miracles along the way, you've got a true church. And this is the source of their, and I think it's a combined confidence. I mean, it's Paul who says it in verse 6, very famous verse. But it's also important to understand where does this confidence come from? You know, it's like the realm of faith. To be a believer in Christ is not blind faith. It is a confidence. It is a faith that has a foundation to it based in reality of experience and trust. And what Paul writes, being confident of this very thing that he says to the church at Philippi, his benefactors, those who have supported him in his ministry life, financially, emotionally, spiritually, being confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. That's something, isn't it? When you have that confidence about the involvement of Jesus Christ in the work of your church, that is a tremendous confidence builder. And Paul's prayer for them that we see in the last three verses of this passage, verses 9 through 11, is simply that they continue, that they continue. He says, this I pray for this church, that your love may abound still more and more in the knowledge and all discernment. And there is one thing that we can say about the love of Christ, and that is that it will grow as you continue to stay, to continue on, learn, grow in knowledge and all discernment. And if there's anything that's needed in the last day's church that is so threatened in our time, it is spiritual discernment. And this is what Paul prays for, especially during the threatening times that this church existed, that you may approve the things that are excellent, uh, those things that God would approve, in other words, that you may be sincere and without offense Integrity is something that's very important in the heart of a believer. You're not double-minded, that you're continually feeding on the Word of God and being filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Just continuing on in the simple things, the, the manner of faith, you know, continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in breaking bread and in fellowship and prayers, as it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And many people are looking outside the church for all sorts of exciting things that they can bring in, new things. But as Pastor Chuck always said, one of his personal proverbs, if it's new, it isn't true. And if it's true, it isn't new. And it's very important for the church not to be so mindful of things that are exciting as it is things that are grounded and true. And to continue steadfastly to walk step by step, hand in hand with the Lord Jesus Christ in the things that he would teach and all of this right down to the end, right down to the day of Christ. That could either be the rapture or it could be the day that you go into the kingdom of heaven yourself, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ and to the glory and praise of God. That's why all this exists. That's why this church at Philippi exists. That's why this church here exists is to the glory and praise of God. And of their obvious concern for his present condition, Paul writes, beginning at verse 12, but I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me, remembering that he's in prison, and some of you may be aware of all the things that Paul went through along the way to get to that Roman prison, but I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me, have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. So that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. 
The former preached Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains. But the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel, uh, the word apologia, apologetics, uh, to defend the gospel, to have a reasonable explanation about the gospel? What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and in this, in this, that Christ is preached, that the gospel is delivered, in this, I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. And what Paul is informing them of, being aware that they are aware, um, most especially proven by the fact that they had sent him a gift where he was in this Roman prison, as I mentioned earlier, that is Paul talks about in the 10th verse of chapter 4, that he knows their concern for the condition that he finds himself in, and he tells them, this has all happened to me for the furtherance of the gospel. Every bit of it. God is in this, even in this. And he relates his exposure to the entire Praetorian guard. Uh, note there in verse 12, that word palace is in the Greek Praetorian. And the Praetorian guard was something very special there at Rome. That was the, the elite of the military forces. Um, those who served in the military, the equivalent to our Navy SEALs or something like that. Uh, the Praetorian Guard were those that were specifically charged with the security of the emperor. And it was a select position, and it was something that men would hold and, and graduate out of and then go on to become the leaders in the city and in the Senate and so forth. Very powerful men, very able men. And Paul relates to the church at Philippi in his letter that the whole palace guard, the whole Praetorian guard, Nero's special forces have been, what? They've been exposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Paul's had the opportunity to share with them, each one of them, it seems, the whole Praetorian guard. And of the example of boldness, in the face of persecution, he is set for others to share the gospel regardless of their motive. And, and again, we have this sort of curious way that, that Paul expresses this. And it's worthy, I think, of noting that where he goes with this is so very important that, that the gospel is preached. And he plainly indicates that in some cases, maybe even in many cases, the gospel is preached out of an impure motive whatever that may be. And he seems to indicate that some of them were doing it with derision toward Paul, perhaps over the fact that he had been imprisoned and thinking that meant that he was in some way disqualified for, from ministry, that he had been exposed or something of that sort. And then others looking on had their boldness enhanced by the fact that Paul continued to, with this knowledge, that Paul continued to preach the gospel even though he was in prison and being persecuted wrongfully. Uh, it's all sort of fascinating to think about what's related here. Joe Foch kind of shares a story that illustrates this in a way that I couldn't think of a better illustration, so I'll just use Joe's illustration. Imagine if a fellow who wanted nothing to do with Jesus Christ and yet had a wife who was a born-again believer in Jesus Christ who attended this church and he brought her by on Sunday morning, dropped her off at the church, and then he proceeded to go on to a, a bar and sit in a sports bar for the next couple hours, having a few drinks, watching television, and just sort of, you know, grousing about the fact that he had to leave his wife at the church and irritated by the whole thing. And now imagine another man who comes in and, and sits next to him and begins to, to drink, drink after drink after drink, and, he, and he's just... He's crying, and, and they begin a conversation, and the man who dropped his wife off at church, he's grumbling, and the, the guy who's got tears coming down his eyes 
is saying, well, you know, what, what are you upset about? And, and he mentions he's upset about the fact that he had to drop his wife off. Joe said Calvary Chapel, Philadelphia, but I'll use Calvary Chapel, Gulf Coast. I had to drop my wife off at Calvary Chapel, Gulf Coast, that, that place. They, they, all they do at that church is teach the love of Jesus and that all your sins can be forgiven and you can be saved if you place your faith in Jesus Christ. And I don't believe any of that nonsense. And the guy who's, who's crying, He's like, what? what? What did you just say about all of your sins being forgiven? Because he's a man who's completely broken, and that's why he's in the bar in the first place. He's at the end of himself, and here's a man grousing about the gospel and yet presenting it, and here's a man who needs to hear the gospel, and he, his ears and his heart is broken by the fact that all of his sins can be forgiven. That's exactly what he needed to hear in that time. And so the gospel was preached even by a man who wanted nothing to do with it. An impure motive, if there ever was one. And yet, the gospel was preached. And there's probably many other ways that we can look at that. You know, some of the showboat pastors and all that sort of thing that, that are out there in the world today. And yet, the gospel is being preached, and Paul recognizes and, and presents to them, this is the most important thing, regardless of any man's motive, that indeed the gospel is preached. And he says to this church, this church that he loves so well and that loves him so well, no matter how this turns out, I know Christ will deliver me. He's in prison, remember. And he says, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor, yet what I shall choose I, ca I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better, Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you for all your progress and joy of faith, even from prison, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Look, the reality is no one, no one, and nothing can stop any man whose true declaration is what we see Paul state in verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And that's a very wonderful passage, but there is a meaning to it that we also need to comprehend, and the meaning to that is that the only way to die is gain is if to live is Christ. Do you see the connection? The only way that any of us can say that to die is gain is if we can also say, for me, to live is Christ. Not for me to live to make money. Not for me to live to gain power. Not for me to live to gain authority or whatever it is, recognition, fame, whatever that may be. The only way that equation works to die is gain, is if to live is Christ. Very important. And Paul says that forthrightly about himself. And if you think about it, a man who says that, a man that is the true declaration, with sincerity, as he mentioned earlier, if that's your true declaration, then nothing the enemy breaks, brings against you uh, we talked about the, the magnitude of spiritual attack, principalities and powers and all that um, last week when we studied the armor of God together. No man, no enemy, no demon presence can dismay you, discourage you, disappoint you, or deceive you if the true statement of your heart is to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's a statement of victory. It is a statement of truth that can only be made by a man or a woman who know in their heart that it is the truth, to live as Christ. And the absolute joy of knowing, even in a Roman prison, the absolute joy of knowing you're in the very center of God's will for your life. 
no matter the circumstances that you find yourself in, any and all circumstances, I mean, they're listed here in, in verses 22 through, through 26. And what Paul can truly say, my desire, I mean, if, if what jumps off the page here, my desire is equal to God's desire. That's all I care about. My desire, I want my desire to be formed by God's desire for my desire in the same manner that Psalm chapter 37 verse 4 declares, very important statement about knowing the will of God, foundational statement about knowing the will of God for your life, to be in the very center of God's will for your life, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord, absolutely, that's what Paul has done and is doing. And so God is forming the desires of Paul's heart. And so even in the midst of a Roman prison, Paul looks around and, and with God's desire, God has him there in that prison for a reason, Paul understands it. To write these prison epistles, to write much of the New Testament, could that be a reason that Paul had to be set on the shelf for a bit? but he continues to minister and he's reaching out to the Praetorian Guard. Uh, many people believe that he actually had an audience with Nero and it was in Nero rejecting the gospel of Jesus Christ that, that it was only then that he went mad but because up until that point he had been a sort of a reasonably functional human being and a, and a fair leader. But many historians cite that after he had his audience with Paul and rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ, that's when he went mad. Could that have something to do with it? Did the demonic forces then move in? And it's fascinating to know, Jesus told Paul he must go to Rome. Do you remember the, the story? It's, it's Acts chapter 23, after Paul had been arrested in Jerusalem, Jesus came to Paul in his prison cell and said, be of good cheer. This is chapter 23 in the book of Acts, verse 11. Be of good cheer. Paul, evidently Paul was probably downcast at being arrested and having his ministry halted and over his failure to reach the Jews at Jerusalem, which had been the great desire of his heart. Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so now you must, and I emphasize the word must, Jesus speaking, so now you must bear witness at Rome, you must. And Jesus just told Paul he was going to go to Rome. You must go to Rome, but he didn't tell him how he was going to get there. It wasn't an easy trip, was it? Could have been very discouraging if Jesus hadn't come on the front end and said, you must go to Rome. We know the, the travails of, of the journey and, and being held as a, as a prisoner and the shipwreck and all that. Not delightful circumstances at all. He never told Paul how it was that he would get to Rome. He never told Paul how long he would be at Rome. He certainly, at this point, didn't necessarily anticipate being held in prison in Rome. And Jesus also didn't tell him if he would ever leave there. And in all of this, Paul understood not just his words, but his life must be an example to this church, to the church at Philippi, and to all the other churches that he planted, and for all the churches that would follow until the day of Jesus Christ. And that our conduct, seeing this, by his example, may be worthy of suffering. Well, I wish you hadn't brought that into that, Pastor Bill that our conduct, our conduct, think about Paul's conduct throughout this season of his life, may be worthy of suffering. Pasco in the Greek, um, pain, passion is another way that we see it expressed. And that our conduct, think of it, would be worthy of suffering whether we actually suffer or not. That it would be worthy of suffering. And we see in Acts chapter 5, the, I love it that when they had been before the Sanhedrin, uh, Peter and John, in, in verse 41, uh, after being threatened, and 
after they had been beaten. They left there. They departed from the presence of the council. And what did they do? They were rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. And so we conclude with, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come to see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs. I'll be, I'll be watching to see how this turns out in your life. that you stand fast, sounds familiar from last week, doesn't it? In one spirit, with one mind, giving, striving together for the faith of the gospel and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation and that from God. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now you saw that in me when i was with you remember that that time i got arrested and i was beaten and now again you hear that once again is going on in my life now now you hear again that that is in me and what he speaks of is conduct that is worthy it's that word axios again that, that on that that scale if you will that, that your conduct would be worthy of the weight of the gospel of jesus christ in your life and and worthy of the gospel it's we read here to be worthy to have conduct worthy of the gospel means that your conduct is worthy of suffering because those whose lives are worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ can be, will be, trusted by God with all the suffering the gospel entails. That's news, isn't it? That's a fresh word for the church at Philippi. And what it speaks of primarily is death to the flesh and the flesh will not willingly participate in its own death. That's something that only the power of the Holy Spirit can bring about in your life according to the word of God, and that whatever suffering may come will only serve to grow the body of Christ in its unity of mind, heart, and spirit. Isn't that what he says in the second half of verse 27? To stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Suffering and affliction produce that in the life of a church. Persecution produces that in the life of a church. And for those that are in the church, enduring that by the power of God as Paul is in this Roman prison and as they look to Paul for that example for their lives, this serves as further proof of God's salvation for you, doesn't it? When you go through this, When your conduct is not only worthy of the gospel, but worthy of suffering, again, whether you suffer or not, the integrity of that conduct that's worthy of the gospel, it serves as further proof of God's salvation for you. It strengthens you in your faith, according to your faith. And that's why Jesus said, you know, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10, you know, don't fear those who can kill the body, and after that they can't do anything else to you, but, but fear him who is in heaven, that after your body is killed, he can destroy your soul in hell. That's, that's who you should fear, the King of kings and Lord of lords, not man. And the church at Philippi could be trusted with the graceful severity of these words that we read in, in verses 29 and 30. For to you, it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here is in me. And so the church at Philippi could be trusted with words like that. Those are very challenging words, aren't they? to a church that he loves so well. 
and that loves him so well. This is the kind of free exchange that you can have with people who are sincere in their desire to know the Lord Jesus Christ and to live according to his will for their life. This is how honest you can be. This is sincerity of the kind of sharing that can be involved. And Paul had that confidence that this church could abide in the graceful severity of the words that he speaks here, that he writes. Uh, do these words also apply to the church at Estero? Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for, I think, the kindness of, in many ways, what, what comes as a, a sort of warning to the church of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we look out on the world today and, and we see a world that is seeking to impose itself not only upon the hearts of those who are the church, those who populate the true church of Jesus Christ, uh, to impose its, its values, to try to bring about a, a lessening in the severity of of what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a follower of Christ. Uh, but we also likewise remember what you, Jesus, said, that if any man would follow after me, let him take up his cross daily and die to himself, and then come and follow after me. And we note as we continue in an attitude of prayer, what an invitation that is. <laughs> ah. You want to follow Jesus? Take up your cross. And the cross was a, a killing machine. It wasn't a, a fancy full piece of, of jewelry and it wasn't symbolic of, of religion or anything of the sort. It was an implement designed by men to kill other men an executioner's tool. And Jesus meant what he said when he said that if any man would follow after me, let him take up his cross daily and die to himself. And then, you see the, that death, that surrender that's required for someone who is mired in sin, and we all are, to see that cross for what it truly is. It's a place of surrender, and it is a place of, of the complete yielding of the flesh. But it's also a place of forgiveness. It's also a place of, of forgiveness for all the sins committed by that flesh, all the sins that flesh desires to commit, all the actions both covert, uh, the actions that you've committed, and, and all the sin that you've only just thought about. God knows about that as well. And he says, look upon my son. I sent him into the world to forgive all of that. And the Bible says that God so loved you. He said the world, but I want to single you out here today. God so loved you that he sent his only begotten son into the world to die to pay the price for your sins. He so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that which was the most precious to him, that which was indeed God himself in human form. God himself died to pay the price for your sins. That you may be forgiven. That you may gain entry into the kingdom of heaven forever and ever. That's, that's God's desire. And the interesting thing about all of this is that the price has already been paid. And all you have to do is receive that gift. It's grace. It's free. But you also have to surrender to it. And you have to yield to the Lordship of Christ. And that's equally important to understand. But up till now, up till this very moment, you've been in charge. How's that going for you? The life of, of destruction and despair and brokenness can all be brought to an end. 
when you surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, for he will set you on a path of righteousness according to God's word by the power of the Holy Spirit made alive in you when you are born again. That's what it means to be born again. So if you desire to be born again today, we're going to play a song of invitation. And at the conclusion of the song, as you're thinking these things through, if you are not yet born again, if you have not made Jesus the Lord of your life, if you have not received the forgiveness of your sins, as we play the song, if you would prayerfully consider these things in your heart, and at the conclusion of the song, if you desire to make Jesus your Lord, if you desire to surrender to Christ Jesus, if you desire to be born again, then I'm going to lead you in a word of prayer. And that will be your choice to make. But I can promise you that, that God is already knocking on your heart because he loves you. And he desires to transform your life into his image. That you would leave yourself behind and make yourself be made into the likeness of Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.